Good morning and welcome back. Since we all speak a language, languages and their study are simple. If we can all do it, they can't be difficult, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. Every language is complex, joining together myriads of single words into sentences, short and long, simple and complicated. We connect them using a set of rules we have so internalized that we are rarely ever conscious of them. What happens when a language changes, or indeed undergoes the biggest change of all, that from being only spoken to developing a writing system and becoming a language that can also be read? That's the linguistic and cultural phenomenon we'll learn today, um, that we will learn about today from a young scholar named Jessica Boyton, who teaches here at Gillette College. Jessica earned her BA in linguistics from Eastern Michigan University, where she graduated magna cum laude in 19, 2005. You can see I'm older than, I can't get into the new, gener, new, new uh, century here. Uh, she then was awarded a Fulbright uh, Research Fellowship and went to the University of Western Australia for three years, where she did primary field, field research in Aboriginal languages and earned her master's degree. So today, Jessica Boynton is going to speak that, to us on writing a previously unwritten language. Jessica. All right, so I've got a fair bit of material to cover, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I'm going to start by kind of defining what I mean by an unwritten language, because it, it turns out it's a little bit, everything in this field is more complex than it seems, and this is as well. Um, there are around 7,000 languages spoken in the world, and of those, the vast majority are what I would call unwritten. And this means either that no orthography has ever been developed at all, or that no orthography has been well accepted. And the languages that I work with mostly fall into that second category. A lot of times, missionaries have actually gone in and created a writing system for the purposes of translating the Bible, or at least portions of it. So they've gone in, mostly starting in around the 1940s, 1950s, and there's actually a huge surge of orthographies that were developed at that time, and simply because that's when the tradition shifted from trying to teach them a liturgical language or English or the, a language that the Bible is already written in to translating it into their language because it's thought that they can under, only understand God through their heart language. Um, and that's their indigenous one. So we see a, a surge of development. However, not many of them have actually been well accepted. Um, linguists themselves have often created unsuccessful orthographies as well. What ends up happening with these missionary scripts is that you get a Bible translation you actually fail to teach anybody to really use that writing system, so they end up with just a selection of the Bible translation just on their bookshelf. And it serves as a rather interesting emblem of their identity, because, for example, in the case of Aboriginal Australians, it sort of simultaneously is an emblem of their Aboriginality and of their emerging Christianity, but it's not actually a resource that's read, and it's also not a system that's used to write. So you get a Bible translation written for you, and at best you read it. You're never actually expected to write down the language yourself. So these are the sorts of situations that I come into. Now the real context of this, for me anyway, is endangered languages. So many of the languages that are unwritten, and honestly many of the languages in the world are what many linguists call endangered. There aren't that many speakers left. Australia is sort of the most extreme example of this where most of the languages there, and there were 250 or so at the time of contact, um, have less than 50 speakers. So we're talking about quite severely endangered languages there. Many of those speakers are aged 60 years or older. The younger generations aren't speaking the languages anymore, although that itself is more complex than that, and I'm just not <laughs> going to get into that today. And many of those languages have already disappeared in Australia, especially the ones on the East Coast where initial contact was made, and. Um, Europeans liked to settle. They, they didn't really want to settle in the desert, so in the middle of the desert, a lot of the languages are spoken a little bit more, but on the coast where it's nice weather, there's been more displacement. And while Australia is really kind of the extreme example of this, this story is repeated worldwide, including in native North America. There were also several hundred languages spoken here at first contact, and many of them are disappearing, or have disappeared. So what links these two together? And what makes me have to worry actually quite a lot about writing systems? Typically, 
it's considered necessary to write a language down in order to save it, in order to preserve or maintain it. And we can also question whether we should preserve or maintain it, and that actually is going to come up a little bit later in my talk, although I'm not going to go into great depth about it. But this assumption is often made. So oftentimes, the first thing, at least one of the first things a linguist does when he or she goes into a community and wants to get the language back into use is to figure out a way of writing it down that people are going to accept or figure out how to take this non-accepted orthography and get people using it. And those choices have um, a lot of things to take into consideration. So the basics of what I'm going to go over today, I'm going to talk over the really foundational concerns. There are actually three core decisions that have to be made. And then I'm going to talk about the sorts of information or considerations that you have to make when making those three major decisions. Then I'm going to talk very, very briefly about English writing, because we all know that English writing is jacked. Right? So I'm going to talk about some of the reasons it looks the way that it does. And then I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about Wangza writing. So Wangza is the language I worked with in Australia. And we'll talk about the system there and um, its sort of effects. So getting into the foundational concerns, I'm actually going to present the two kind of together, because the first one, writing system, is, is kind of a bit vague. Right? Writing system is sort of the, the sort of sound or meaning information, or phonetic or semantic information, that you convey through written symbols. I promise it's going to be a bit vague in a minute, but I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of scripts, which is the second consideration to make, because that's just the most sensible way to really illustrate this point. The first sort level of information to convey is with an alphabet, right? So that's where you have a sound that correlates with a symbol. And you might have multiple sort of letters making a single sound. So for example, the symbol T makes a T sound in English writing. T and H together make a th sound, not a t sound. So those are digraphs, right? Monographs are just the T, digraphs are TH, and polygraphs are anything more than that. And some languages can combine three to four symbols to make a single sound. Oh, well, sorry, some writing systems do that. We also have syllabaries. So this one you might not have heard of alphabet. Probably a lot of people assume that's the only way to write a language. But you can also write it so that each sound correlates to a symbol. So you wouldn't have a symbol for t, right? but you'd have a symbol for ta, to, ti, and all of the combinations of that consonant and the vowel that follows. And then the last one is a logography. And that's where symbols correlate to ideas. Roughly speaking, they correlate to entire words, although that's um, a problematic way of defining it, and we'll discuss that a bit later. It's important to note no pure logographies exist, right? because a logography, by definition, tells you nothing about how to pronounce the word. And it turns out that that's pretty tricky, especially if you're trying to adopt a new word and say how it should be pronounced, or write somebody's name, or something like that. Um, it, you don't want to necessarily draw a picture of the person every time you want to talk about them. So these, these are the major kinds of writing systems that there are. First, first consideration to be made. The second one is the script. So that's the actual shapes of the symbols that are used in a writing system. And the best way to explain this and to kind of help explain what I just talked about a little bit more clearly is just through examples. So here we have the Roman alphabet. Right? So this is a sound to symbol sort of correspondence. Right? We have individual sounds. And you can see these are fairly similar, even looking at them, to the, one, the system that we use. Right? But another alphabet that we're probably all at least a bit familiar with is Cyrillic. Probably all of us are at least aware that Cyrillic exists. And once again, we have a correlation between different symbols and different sounds. Frustratingly, for people learning Russian, if something looks like an English letter, <laughs> you don't necessarily pronounce it the English way. I've never studied Russian. My sister has. She could give this part of the talk much better. But there's nothing about this symbol that means you must pronounce it p. That's completely arbitrary. So d don't expect those correlations to continue on. But you do notice, I'm sure, that this looks quite similar. And that's actually because writing has only ever been independently invented a handful of times in human history. Both of these systems, this one, Cyrillic and the Roman and ours, come ultimately from cuneiform and sort of through Phoenician. So Phoenician was about 900 BC, and things have evolved since then in different sorts of alphabets. Another really interesting kind of alphabet 
is the Hebrew abjad. This is actually a consonant alphabet. So this is not the system that's currently used to write Hebrew, Hebrew, but the thing about this, and I suppose it's a bit blurry, is that these are all consonants. There's not a single vowel in there. So classical Hebrew actually didn't render their vowels in writing. And when you think about how wonky English vowels are, how unpredictable it is how a vowel is going to be pronounced if you see it written, English kind of might as well not bother <laughs> rendering its vowels. <laughs> Since this system, they've developed diacritics, the little dots that they put around these symbols to tell you which vowel would follow it. And especially if you're using this script to write Yiddish, you're actually going to use separate symbols for the vowels. But this is a classic consonant um, alphabet. But now, on to syllabaries. Right, so here's a system um, used in India, Devanagari. Right, and this is one of my favorite ones. It's just so pretty. <laughs> and you'll notice here, this is set up in a nice table. That's why I have this one first. This is the symbol for H and A, or this is actually an A ah sound. So this is the symbol for ha, hu, he, ha, he, ha, ho, right? And so on. So this one, it's all of those vowels, but starting with lu, so le, lu, and so on. So you have a whole table. So this stands for an entire consonant. You also have, with these systems, you tend to have a few individual consonant characters, because notice this only allows for consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, right? If you have a consonant at the end of the syllable, you have to add one of these doohickeys, <laughs> right, to make it clear which consonant is coming at the end of that particular syllable. Another syllabary is for Nuktitut, and that's an indigenous language of North America, um, in Canada specifically. And here we have, once again, a bunch of these symbols that correlate very clearly um, to syllables. And then we actually have a very, very long list <laughs> of those radicals, of those consonant symbols that we put at the end, just in case. And that's because Inuktitut actually has more of those than you typically would see in a language that uses a syllabary, but it did it for different sorts of reasons that we'll get into a bit later. And um, we also have Japanese hiragana, right? So here we've got just the vowels a, i, u, e, o, and then ka, ki, ku, ke, ho, sa, shi, su, se, so, and so on. So once again, Japanese actually lends itself extremely well to a syllabary because the only thing that can come at the end of a syllable, um, the only consonant that can come at the end of a syllable is an N, so they only have to have one of those weird things in there. All right, we get into logographies, <laughs> and you'll notice everybody's seen Chinese writing. This is not the extent of the Chinese symbol system. <laughs> right, there are several thousand of them. And that's, that's one of the reasons that not many languages use these, right? The, the overhead in accessing all of this information is, is really quite extreme. And notice each of these symbols has its own sort of concept that it's conveying. You can combine a couple of separate symbols to have some sort of joint understanding. The, the really classic case is actually for Japanese kanji, which borrows these and is itself a logography. And Japanese has three different ways of writing. Is that there's a symbol for woman, and if you put three of those woman symbols together, it means noisy. And if you put those three together under the symbol for a roof, it means trouble. <laughs> 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 you also learn a little bit about the culture and the ways they combine these things. <laughs> um, and notice I said this isn't a pure logography. None of those exist. The only one I've ever heard of is for a language somebody made up for fun. Um, so there are actually sound correspondences to these as well. They're just not that strictly enforced. Um, Epiolmic is another logography. It's actually kind of difficult to find something that looks like a good logography. Um, hieroglyphs are kind of an example, although those can get to the iconography side of things. Uh, but notice this one has quite clear syllabary sorts of sound correspondences as well. Um, this is a language indigenous to Mexico. It's no longer spoken. Olmec kind of came out of it. This technically means old Olmec. Um, and this is actually a contested chart. That people, people don't really agree on what's going on, but I believe in Terry Kaufman, who's the one who came up with this stuff. So. All right, so those are a bunch of examples of writing systems and the scripts that we can use to encode them. Notice there, there's no real reason that a certain symbol has to be a logography, a certain symbol has to be a syllabary. That, that's arbitrary. You do tend to see logographies are more complex than syllabaries, which are more complex than alphabets as far as each individual character. And that's just about 
If you're writing with an alphabet, you have to write every character a lot of times. If they were as complex as Chinese symbols, you would get really flippin' tired <laughs> of putting that much care into every sound you're trying to convey. The other thing, and this is a, a little bit hairier, is orthographic depth. Right? And that's really how detailed should that writing be. There are three options, and I'm going to make you participate. <laughs> All right, one is the morphemic level. Morphemic, we're talking about morphemes. A morpheme is the smallest unit of language that has its own individual meaning. So if you have the word cats, right, that combines two morphemes. You have cats, which is a little, little furry meowy thing, right, <laughs> vaguely. And then you have s, which is plural. Put those two morphemes together, and you have a, a new sort of meaning, right? So what the question is, with deciding whether to register, represent something at the morphemic level, is should the same morpheme, or should the same sort of word chunk always look the same, even as if, if it's pronounced differently? English has some morphemic writing, right? So, for example, we write kith instead of kissed, right? This is the way it really sounds. This is much closer to what we actually say. But notice if we write it this way, we preserve the kiss, right? And it's nice to preserve kisses. And we preserve the ed to mark past tense. So it's, it's clear which morphemes are involved in putting that word together. Same with dogs, interestingly enough. If you pronounce this word, right, you're not saying dogs, right? You're saying dogs. Right? But once again, in order to keep it clear that this is the, the same S as the one here, right, we write it as an S. Does that make a tolerable amount of sense? <laughs> All right, so the next level that we can go to, it's a smaller level of meaning, is phonemic. And here we're talking about phonemes. And that's the underlying sound that may be transformed when you're pronouncing something. And the question to ask there is should the same underlying sound make sense? And this is where audience participation comes into play. I'm about to convince you that half the time when you think you're saying T, you're not. <laughs> so you probably think that most of these T's, at least, are the same letter. But go ahead and say tell and put your hand in front of your mouth when you do it. I've been waiting for that for so long. <laughs> I feel the power. All right, do you feel that puff of air that comes out when you say the t, right? Now, say stop. stop. Now, you felt a puff of air when you said the p, right, the p at the end, but the t, you did not. That's because while t is the underlying form, right, and this is just the way a linguist would describe the sounds that are going on, right, the T here, after an S, there's actually a phonological rule that all speakers of American English apply, and actually most Englishes apply, that say, okay, if you have this sound, but it's coming after an S, you don't put that puff of air on there. We do not hear the difference between those two sounds. That's why I made you put your hand in front of your mouth, right? A speaker of Korean or Arabic absolutely hears the difference between those sounds because they make a difference, just like the difference between T and D is important in our language. Right? We think we're doing that, we apply this rule, and that's what happens. And so for butter, right? this one we're a little bit, you don't have to. <laughs> for butter, this one we're a little bit more attentive to because there are sorts of status things to do with saying it like butter, right? saying it like British, which is a very high prestige language. Um, but we have another rule that says that you change it into sort of a tap. It's almost like a D. Right, and here, once again, if you do this, and I made kind of an idiot of myself at a bus stop doing this with the word goat once, <laughs> if you say that, it actually ends up being a glottal stop, which is a sound in the middle of uh-oh, say foot, foot, right? If you're told to pronounce it correctly, you'll say foot, but that's not how you actually pronounce it. You apply this rule, and so on. So there are all these different ways of pronouncing what we think is the same letter, and in English, clearly, we pretty much always say, you know, the same underlying sound should always look the same. Why? Because every native speaker of English is going to pronounce it correctly because they're going to apply the phonological rule. The next level is the phonetic level. And this one's what we tend to think that writing should look like, but it's actually a disaster if we try. This is about phones. So that's the sound as it's actually pronounced. And the question is, should writing represent what is actually pronounced, right? And the obvious answer seems to be yes, but it turns out no writing systems are fully phonetic. It's not practical. In fact, linguists 
when we transcribe speech for phonetic analysis, we come about as close as anybody does to rendering it exactly how it's pronounced. And even we end up being pretty far from perfect because we're going to focus on the sorts of sounds that are important to us and for our analysis at that moment. And the closest thing that we get, and I'm going to make you pronounce things again, <laughs> um, to phonetic writing in English is the prefix in. Right? So it means the same thing in all of these cases. But look here, it's written with an N, and if you feel it, in, 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 right? it's in the same place as the T, actually. Here, impact, it's the same sound, but notice if you say a P, that uses your two lips. Right? So what do we do? We move this nasal that's actually kind of behind your teeth to between your lips. We do a M instead. That one, we write. So that's us saying, you know what, these are the same sound underlyingly. It's just that we're applying this rule that says this is, this is a nasal. Nasals are kind of wimps. They tend to move to wherever the letter after them is pronounced. Um, so it's just that rule, and we're, we're going to write it down. But we're not consistent about that one. If you say inconsiderate, the N there is actually a ng, like the end of the word sing, right? Why? Because that's where the K is, or sorry, the C is pronounced. K -k. It's towards the back of your mouth. So you send the nasal there as well. We don't write this ing, consider it, right? Also, this one we don't even have the sound as far as we're aware. Infallible, go p, p, p. Come on, guys, just because I laughed at you for the hand thing. Right. <laughs> Notice that that one, you have your front teeth on your bottom lip, right? Now feel where you're actually putting that N, infallible. That N is actually in the same place, and we don't write that down. And that one you probably never even imagined you were doing. Right? So phonetic writing, not very prominent in English. That's not really an insult to English, not really prominent in any writing system. So those are really the foundational concerns. Right? We've got what sort of writing system are we going to use, what sort of script are we going to use, and what sort of orthographic depth are we going to use? Are we going to be looking at morphemes, phonemes, or phones? Right, so the sorts of things that we need to take into consideration when we're deciding where to go with these, there are, there are a lot of different kinds. The major distinction is language internal and language external. Linguists are quite good at the language internal ones. These are things that are about the language itself, regardless of the people who speak it. So for example, syllable type. Certain languages lend themselves to syllabaries better than others. Japanese, I said, is one of them because it really is very much a consonant vowel optional consonant at the end sort of language. Every syllable looks like this. And remember, the only consonant that goes into that slot in Japanese is N. And you see that even when it, it changes the words it borrows. So if it borrows the word scarf, which it has, right, it makes it sukafu. So it makes it consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. And McDonald's is makudanurodo, right? So <laughs> they, they force it to fit that. That's part of the reason the syllabary works so well. Notice this only takes the syllable symbols. It doesn't necessi uh, necessitate any of those just consonant radical symbols. Right, we've also got functional load, which is another major consideration. And that's basically most writing systems render the sorts of things that are necessary to avoid ambiguity. That is not to say that we've managed to avoid ambiguity altogether. One of the beauties of language is that it is so ambiguous. <laughs> Um, but basically, will failing to render the distinction result in ambiguity frequently, right? So if we remember that in prefix, rendering it in, right? Rendering that syllable or that symbol is only going to matter. Well, it's never really going to matter. All it's telling us is that an underlying nasal of a different type underwent some phonological change, right? And as English speakers, we automatically do that. We don't need that information. However, Rendering the difference between a P and a B actually can make a difference between what word we mean. So that's useful to render. Much more comprehensive and extensive right, is the language external stuff. So some of the first things to consider are technology. <laughs> if you've got a keyboard, right, if you want to make a resource that's really available, you want to keyboard it in, it's really nice to already have that keyboard available. That's why a lot of indigenous scripts are based on the same alphabet that we use, because keyboards of that type are very freely available. Not freely, but very widely available. Um, you also, and this is kind of technology, I don't know, I didn't want to do a whole new slide for this. <laughs> um, readability. 
It turns out that the system is based on morphemes and phonemes, so not on how it's actually pronounced, but on our sort of underlying concept of things, are much better for fluent reading. We actually read by kind of spot-checking words and recognizing them, not by individual sounds. So fluent reading relies on that. Now, learning to read is easier with more phonetic systems, and we see that even with the way English um, literacy is taught sometimes, they'll start with a more phonetic version of the alphabet and then teach the, the real alphabet that we use to try to get used to pronouncing sounds. But if, if you've got a good literacy infrastructure, you don't have to worry too much about how hard it is to learn. It's going to happen. If people can learn the Chinese logography, we, we can make this work. Um, it's also the case that using a familiar system can ease transfer of literacy. So if everybody's already literate in English, it stands to reason that using the same writing system with roughly the same sound symbol correspondences is going to make it easier for them to learn to read in their own language. On the other hand, um, reading an unfamiliar language. So if we're looking at a language that we don't know how to speak, really, in order to do that with correct pronunciation, so imagine you don't even have a teacher who speaks it to pronounce things for you, you really need a very, very phonetic system. Right, so these are sort of readability concerns to take in. Um, other things, we want to worry about dialect variation. One of the beauties of the English system is that with minor spelling difference aside, we can understand something written by someone who speaks a dialect that we would actually maybe have some trouble understanding if they were speaking to us. You know, no matter how deep your Scottish accent is when you're writing English, other than putting extra U's in there and changing Z's to S's and things like that, it's going to be very, very readable to us. Um, so what does this mean? Speakers of different dialects can understand each other's writing. You can, show, you can write a material for lots of dialects with just one book. Um, on the other hand, if you do a very phonetic sort of system, each individual dialect is going to need its own resource. You're going to have a major duplication of effort. Finally, we've got cultural concerns, and this, this is really the stuff that's most interesting to me um, and really much more complicated than what I'm presenting. But we have ideas of distinctiveness and autonomy, right? People sometimes want their writing systems to show them as being distinctive from the other people around them. So Anuktitut, you remember, is a really good example. These people are all literate in English, right? Why not? Just to write, it wouldn't be so difficult to write it just with these, right? To write L-U for Lu, that wouldn't be such a big deal. But they want to show how distinctive they are from the English speakers who they see as oppressing them, right? So for them, it's worth it not just to create their own symbols, right? That wasn't distinctive enough. They used an entirely different writing system. They used a syllabary instead of an alphabet. Um, this was partially modeled after the Cherokee syllabary, which is actually quite successful um, and was invented in the 1800s, so it's quite old for a Native American script. Um, well, Native North American, anyway. On the other side of the spectrum, right, we've got ideas of showing allegiance and lending or borrowing prestige from another group. So really, people sometimes use writing systems to show allegiance with another group or some sort of social category, to show their membership. So the best example of this is Hindi versus Urdu. So Hindi and Urdu are both languages of India. Not that long ago, they were actually the same language for cultural and theological reasons. Um, they've sort of become more and more different as time has gone by. A lot of people argue that they're still mutually intelligible, which means that somebody, two people can be in a conversation, one person can be speaking Hindi, one person can be speaking Urdu, and they'll have a, a reasonable understanding of what each other are saying. But let's look at the way they write their languages. Right, so this is the Hindi system. Right, it looks kind of similar to Devanagari. Right? Um, and notably, we're comparing this right now to Sanskrit. This is the liturgical language of Hindu, right? Step forward, here's Urdu, right? And here, just for comparison, is a script for Arabic, the, the liturgical um, language of Islam. So just looking at that, who is Muslim? Right, looking at that, who is Hindu, right? So they write in quite different ways, even though really, if they were to write in the same way, they could probably understand each other's writing, but it shows their allegiance to their religion. It also shows some political allegiances. It's, it's actually quite a powerful tool, even though they can't, I mean, their language isn't that similar to Arabic, right? They can't, they can't use this similarity in writing to have an easier time understanding Arabic unless they've actually studied Arabic, which granted, if they're 
Muslim, they have. <laughs> There's also, um, people may want to borrow the prestige of another group, and this is so widespread that it's not even makes sense to bring in an example, really, but it's that if a language has a higher power, you use that script because the fact that you can be written in the same basic way means that your languages are of equal value. And especially when we're talking about minority languages, endangered languages, we're talking about languages spoken by people who have been told very purposefully that their language and culture are worthless and that they need to be abandoned for this other group. So this can, just like the differentiation actually, be used as a sign that we are just as good as you our language is just as valid as yours. Look at the way we can represent it just like yours. Um, that is emphatically not what I see in Aboriginal Australia, <laughs> however. So now that we've gotten through really the, the major considerations that need to be made, I'll very quickly, because I think I'm over time, um, talk about English writing, and then as quickly as I can, while doing it justice, Wongava writing. So if you look at English writing, we use the Latin alphabet, right? Syllabary would really be kind of stupid for English. We have extremely complex syllables, or um, not, not to the degree that, say, Russian or a lot of indigenous languages of the Americas do. We've also borrowed the prestige from Latin. Notice Latin is a liturgical language of Christianity, right? So there's still, there's a very strong link between liturgical language and the sort of script that you use. Um, and also, at the time that we were figuring out exactly how we want to write our language, the vast majority of people who were literate at all were clergy, they were literate in Latin. So by basing it off the Latin script and making it an alphabet, we eased the transfer of that literacy. And we also have a morphophonemic system, right? That makes initial di learning difficult, but it means that it's readable across dialects, and when you think about it, English is it's the most widely spoken language of the world when you include second language learners, right? So it's, it's really useful to have a system that allows that sort of understanding. And it also engenders reading fluency. It makes it a lot easier for us to get really quick at reading. Um, and since we have such a strong literacy infrastructure, and a lot of people would ar argue with that, but compared to other languages, we have a very strong literacy infrastructure. The initial learning difficulty is not that big of an issue. I mean, also, a lot of the other sorts of things that people complain about, historical spellings, right? So night is spelled in this completely ridiculous way because once upon a time it was pronounced knicht, right? Sound changes happened, spelling changes didn't. We can complain about writing lagging behind culture as much as we want, but the very practical benefit of that is that we can have much easier access to our literary or tradition than we would if we did change our spellings as quickly as pronunciation changed. Having to memorize the pronunciation of a few weird combinations of symbols is nothing compared to having to relearn a completely different writing system to read something that's 100 years old. So Wangala writing. <laughs> so the Wangala system, right? This is one of those missionary developed writing systems. And linguistically, internally, right? So if we just look at what's best for the kind of language it is, it's extremely elegant. Right? It makes only important distinctions. So for example, because P and B are considered by those people to be the same sound, just like T and T are considered the same to us, they don't render that distinction. They're all rendered P, and it's the same for T and D are the same, so they're all written as T, and K and G are the same, so they're all written as K. Right? So very elegant there. Um, we find, well, they found ways to clearly, mm, render sounds that don't exist in English. So there's all these words like maru, right, which actually for an American English speaker you can kind of nail with the writing. Um, barna and gardiri, so that's kangaroo, earth, and teeth. Right, these are all sounds that are uh, right, that's one sound. It looks like two, but it's one, it's a digraph. This is a way of writing it that actually helps you pronounce it pretty closely to accurately, you would think. Um, there's also more nasal sounds, so m and n we're familiar with, but arn. Right, which is again barna, nyini, which means cute. Right, ny is a sound in this language, and ngura, so that's camp. Um, ng is a distinctive sound in this language, and we found way, or they found ways to write those in ways that seem pretty clear. And for Odo, it's worth this means spear thrower, maru, and nindi means smart. Um, for vowels, because remember I said vowels are ridiculous in English, so it doesn't use English sorts of writings for vowels. Like most orthographies based on English, it uses the International Phonetic Alphabet instead, which looks a lot more like Spanish vowels. 
So it, an A is, sounds ah all the time, an E, or sorry, an I sounds like E all the time, a U sounds like ooh all the time, and so on. And everybody hates it, right? this elegant system. Um, I, people complain about that more than anything else when I'm, I'm trying to talk to them about language. Why? Because there are all these language external considerations that need to be made. People speak English first. They do not learn their Aboriginal languages first. They get fluent in this one. What does that mean? They have English phonemes. Right, so whatever the underlying sound is supposed to be in Wangava, it's not. They supplant it with the nearest English equivalent. They also apply English phonolo phonological rules. So if we go back to the Malu, right, I said if you're an American English speaker, you come pretty close to pronouncing that correctly if you just read it. Right? This is Australia. They speak Australian English. In Australian English, you get rid of that R. So they see this word, or they have this word underlyingly, and it comes out Malu. Right? That's quite different from the aboriginal word. Also, people read English first. That's their first literacy, and in fact, it's the only literacy that they're ever trained in. So they've internalized English spelling rules. So for vowels, even though, for example, a U to a, a, to a linguist, the most obvious way to render the oo sound is with a U. But in English, that can be pronounced oo, but it, all, it can also be pronounced uh, right? Like in but, it can be pronounced a lot of different ways. There's no reason for someone who's only been trained to read English to know that that sounds like ooh, <laughs> right? O-O is much clearer, even if it's much less technically elegant. They also expect the same distinctions to be rendered. So the fact that P and B are written the same way is extremely irritating. That's like us saying that their language is less than English because they don't write all the sounds that we do. Right? And that's not what they were saying when they divide this, this system, but that's how it's often interpreted. Um, then, once again, there's no literacy infrastructure. None. Even more crucial, a lot of people don't speak Wangza. The whole point of writing this language down is that the kids don't speak it anymore, that people under 60 don't speak it anymore. And once again, that's oversimplifying things a lot, and we can get into that during the question and answer period if I leave any time for it. But <laughs> Writing is seen as a way of teaching it. So that means that Wonga the readers can't use context clues to figure out what that word actually is and figure out, OK, that's the word, so this is how I pronounce it. Right? In order to pronounce it correctly, they need writing to convey exactly how it's pronounced. And the system that was developed is phonemic, not phonetic. It doesn't give them that information. So the result, horrifyingly, for the people I talk to, is that written Wangatha ends up sounding like English when they talk, like Australian English. They misapply all these rules and it ends up sounding white, right? And this is a very racialized area, so white really is a crucial word there. Also, differences in pronunciation, just minor differences mark distinctive identities. So there are some dialects that are only spoken by 3 to 12 people, and it's always been that way. That's not a language death thing. That's a social mobility, or sorry, a, a mobilization sort of thing. Um, so in order to maintain those distinctions that are often seen as very crucial identifiers of who you are and who your parents are, what your heritage is, everyone needs its own writing rules. Notice I didn't say its own orthography but it, at the very least, needs its own system for saying, if this is what you're reading, this is how you actually pronounce it. And good literacy infrastructure could do that. It does it very successfully. There's no infrastructure here. Um, also, in this culture, individual autonomy is extremely highly valued. I cannot overemphasize. It's quite shocking going in as an American and being confronted with people who, who value their own personal rights much, much more than any American I've met. That means that authority over language, while there are traditional methods of it, it's, it's limited to certain things that don't really extend to all of this correctness stuff. And to some extent, and this is oversimplifying things, but nobody has the right to correct another person's language. Now compare that to us, where everybody in here went through school being told every year how to do your language, right? How to speak it properly, how to write it properly. Those sorts of efforts are just utterly rejected by these people. So the idea of correctness, right, differences. Remember, we have dialects spoken by 3 to 12 people. So for the most part, differences that you aren't things to be corrected, they're just signals of variation, that that person's from that other group. Right? And you do get people mocking the language from other group, but it's not the same as trying to correct them. The exception to that 
is when language or practice has been painted white. Right, and that's what you hear, that if, if you take away our language, you're painting us white. If you make us pronounce it that way, you might as well paint our skin white, because we're not distinctive anymore. Now remember, on the last slide, I said that what the system does is exactly that. It makes it sound more like English. It paints it white. And that, to these people, is the worst thing you could do to language. So some reject writing Wangadha altogether. In some cases, because they actually see it as killing the language. They say, hey, writing makes it sound more like English. And that's, I mean, weirdly, that is the only thing that you could do to make language incorrect. There are a few exceptions that I'm not getting into, but for the most part, that's it. Writing manages to screw it up in the one way that really matters. So some even say, this is not the, the really prominent perspective, but they say it would be better for the language to perish than for it to become like English. We would rather the language not be spoken by anybody than for it to be polluted like that. And you also get sentiments like, Wanga's a living language, not a written one, right? To this consultant um, that I talked to, if you write language down, you kill it, you flatten it, you make it something that it's not, you make it English. Um, it's also thought that it's sort of killing the culture, or at least the cultural practices. So language isn't just about what's pronounced or what's said. It's about a whole set of practices underlying language, right? The correct ways to behave linguistically, the things that you should say to people and that you shouldn't, the ways you should learn language, all sorts of things like that. Writing itself is seen as artificial and Western. And with the valorization of indigeneity and tradition, right, you get that the very value of Wangadha is that it's authentic and aboriginal. So by writing it down, right, that itself is an inauthentic practice. Some are wax a little bit less poetic. So these are extremely passionate views that I have an hour at a time of recording of because people got super into it. Um, but you also get people saying, there's no point in writing Wangza, right? And the, the really great quote is, we don't need writing. What are we gonna do, write each other letters? We have mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, there's a letter in English. All of the formal writing is done in English. You need to write it in English to um, apply for a job. You need to write it in English for all the really common uses of writing. Wangadha has always just been used for conversations between Aboriginal people. Maybe writing Wangadha would have been useful before mobile phones, right? Or if, if texting takes off with Wangadha, maybe it'll become useful. But right now, we'll just bloody call them. Why do we need to write it down? So, confronted with all of this, what's a linguist to do? And I'll tell you, the first thing a linguist does when she's 23 years old and everybody yells at her all the time about what linguists do is that you call your thesis supervisor crying that nobody likes you. But the more sensible response that you eventually come to as you age and become wiser is that the typical approach is to convince them to value Wanga the writing. It's to say, we have all of this knowledge about how to do things. We have to save these people from themselves. Right? And that has obvious problems. So what you do is you create context for Wanga the literacy. You translate traditional stories and put them into Wanga the, make a nice book. Um, a lot of times you actually have prisoners do their um, volunteer, their community service work, drawing the pictures for it, because their the Aboriginal people are overrepresented in prisons. But you end up with this really great book that nobody can read, and it sits on the shelf next to their old Bible translation that nobody can read. Right? It does have powerful, emblematic power, but it hardly helps them read the language. It hardly gives them a language material. Um, add Wong the literacy to the education system. That can fix a lot of problems, right? But you can't get past the possibility, this isn't certain, but the possibility that you're inducing cultural change in the name of preserving the culture. You're saying, I don't care how you usually transmit your language, you have to do it in a school because that's the best way to do it. I don't care what you think about writing your language, you have to write it down because that's the way you save it. You have to change all of these cultural practices that are really a little bit harder to get at, they're a little bit more vague in seeing them, right, in order to get these really superficial sides of culture. Not that language is so superficial, but it's something that's quite obvious what language you're speaking, right? Um, the other solution is just to teach them what we know, right? To say, I have all this learning, it's not my place to make the decisions for you, but at the very least, I can do my best to share with you what we know. So talk to them about the value of writing. Writing does have a lot of value. However, writing a specific language doesn't necessarily, so that's actually a bit problematic. Um, you can talk to them about the best way to design a writing system, especially for their language and their circumstances. Talk to them about literacy education and just let them decide what they're going to do. 
With this group, if you were very, very much hoping that educating them would be successful, you would almost certainly be disappointed. Um, this community will undoubtedly choose heterographia, which basically means everybody makes their own writing system. Right? Everybody who has, who likes the idea of writing the language down, rejects the system that exists and just makes their own. It's, it's that autonomy thing. Nobody can tell me how to write my language. Um, and this community will almost never embrace standardization. If we come out with a set of rules about how to do things, once again, autonomy comes into play. And to them, for a lot of cases, the autonomy thing is far more important than the language thing. If they can have both, great. But if forced to choose, there are, there are some cultural traits that are more prized than others. Um, the other one, and this one's ethically very problematic, but it's OK, I'll just make materials. Won't even necessarily tell you I'm doing it, and I'm going to store it somewhere. That way, later, if you completely lose the language, you can get it back. Right? And that's actually worked very, very well. Our Miami language, which is indigenous to Ohio, not Florida, um, was completely lost. There were no speakers left. But a linguist had gone through and described the language. So what happened was a Miami man decided he wanted his language back. He went and got a master's degree in linguistics so that he could read the description, because linguists aren't very good at writing things that are legible to non-linguists. Um, and he raised his children speaking Miami. There are now some native speakers of Miami again because of that material. But it's not Miami as it was ever spoken before. It's very changed. It shows that the person who was sharing it with his children spoke English first. Um, and in a way, that sort of thing worked for Hebrew and Latin, right? So Hebrew went 2,000 years without really being spoken. It was part of a revival with um, the foundation of Israel. But the, the sort of foremost expert in modern Hebrew doesn't even call it modern Hebrew. He calls it Israeli because it shows so much influence from the fact that the people who revived it spoke Yiddish as their first language. So it can be very successful, but it kind of results in the same kind of language that we would get now with all the English influence. Um, and the idea of sneakily doing something while it might ultimately be nice um, for people, it, it's actually quite arrogant. Um, it is worth it being said that just having that book on the shelf, right, that lends prestige in itself. So if you get people who are comfortable with writing the language, just making a book in it gives them an argument that, hey, my language can be written. I can't bloody read it, but it can be written. It's important. So that is worth considering. So some conclusions, and these are sort of broad generalizations, and I realize I'm a 28-year-old about to tell a bunch of wiser people than me <laughs> what generalizations should be made, but what the hell. Um, a system that is internally valid can still fail. Just because by linguistic standards we did exactly what we needed to do within the language, if we don't take the environment into consideration, there are going to be problems, right? A, a skyscraper built and an, a fault line is going to be designed differently from one that's not. Um, the arrogance of progress can work against us and against our stated goals. We need to ever be conscious of the effect that our own idea of our own success getting in the way of us even recognizing what counts as success for somebody else and the sorts of procedures that would be most effective for them to get their own success if we are invited to help them. Um, and we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? These sorts of complaints that I'm looking at, honestly, not that many people take them seriously. And it's, it's because they come in with, and I, I don't want to use the word arrogance, but they come in with 20 years of schooling and experience, and they have pretty good reason to think that they know a lot. But what these people are saying really makes sense, right? What these community members are saying and that most people see as obstacles to overcome really makes sense. And so we have to really spend time with them. We have to really empathize with them and try to get what, at what they really mean rather than just trying to overcome them. Right? Um, and probably the best example of that, and then I promise I'm done, is that in English, right, we have you're dumb, right? And that's sort of saying that somebody is stupid. And notice dumb, that's inability to speak. Right? And a lot of Native American languages, their rough equivalent of it is you're deaf. Right? An inability to hear, an inability to listen means that you're not intelligent. And I'll, I'll go ahead and close with that. <laughs> the context that I'm looking at it like it's negative and it's bad. Can you think of any positive examples in Australia and around the world where this is not the case or where the cultural language is strengthening? There are some examples of indigenous languages being revived in a very hopeful way. So Maori is a good example in New Zealand. Hawaiian is a good example in Hawaii. 
um, in Hebrew is often taken as a good example. Those are the three prime examples of extremely successful language revitalization. Um, what I tend to see, well, the way I tend to see it, um, ethnicity itself emerges at points of conflict. Right? You, you don't define yourself unless it's in an opposition to a, an other. So the, the irony of globalization is that while it does, I mean, it really does kind of kill languages, it really does sort of homogenize cultures in a lot of ways, it also inspires ethnicity and ethnic revival. The very forces that threaten it are actually what bring it more to light. So that's, that's the closest I, I feel to real hope is that there, there is these surgences of ethnic pride simply because eth people try to make everybody alike. So, I mean, I think that there are more emblems of identity. There, there are more sorts of, this is my language and it's what I'm going to use to show who I am. And other cultures might say, okay, well, this is the way I dress and it's going to be how I show who I am. So I think more of those actually emerge as a result. Are there a lot of variations between right, left to right and right to left? And, and is there any thing you can say with regard to that? That's, I'm always, I'm always looking for research on a general question that way. So most languages are right to left because most humans are right-handed. And if, if you have like an ink quill, it's pretty obvious to you, <laughs> right, that it's, it's nice to write away from the rest of your hand, right? So I, I always wonder, and I've never be, been able to find it, whether languages that are written um, left, or sorry, right to left, yeah, this way, right, are mostly left-handed <laughs> speakers. I don't know about that. Um, but, I mean, you see even more variations than that. The epiomic, if you remember, um, from a few slides back, that one actually is so, is so bizarre the way it's written or the way it's writing is analyzed. Um, it sort of it starts up here, and for the first sentence chunk, it goes like this. And then the second sentence chunk, it goes like this and meets up. And then the third sentence chunk, it goes like that. So you actually, instead of putting periods to mark sentence boundaries, you change the order of the, the symbols, the writing. I mean, Japanese, obviously, you go up from here, up and down, and up and down. So, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of variation, and I'm not sure, other than handedness, and I, I haven't found research on it, I just think that's a fascinating possibility. I haven't found a whole lot of explanations for exactly why. Also, the structure of our sentences changes, too. So you say that our heart and our they say, Right, that's, um, so with language change, you get all sorts of sound changes, and that's what's really obvious in the writing system, because it lags, but you get all sorts of syntactic change. I mean, the, the going argument, and obviously this is hard to prove, um, is that once upon a time everybody spoke the same language, and then it's, in, that's 70, 80,000 years ago, and then over time it's shifted, so really every single distinction you see between languages is the result of some kind of change, and you see quite massive variation. So there's there's a wide realm of possibility in what human languages can do. What's happening with the language right now? Is it evolving? Is it integrating? It's I mean, if you, with your project, fix it at a point in time, the way it's pronounced, even the words that exist, has that just taken a snapshot of the Exactly. All, all you ever got, get is snapshots. And you don't even get a snapshot of the whole language. I mean, when you think about how you use your own language, right, you're constantly changing, depending on who you're talking to, um, how drunk you are. Right? You change the way you talk for all sorts of reasons. So you get just even just a portion of a snapshot of the language. Um, with what's happening with Wangava right now, I'm a <laughs> I was once said to be cautiously pessimistic which means that, I mean, by formal definitions, it's almost certain that the language will die. There are 200 to 300 speakers, so uh, in, in the Australian context, it's actually very, very strong. Um, and it's part of a dialect mesh where there are a lot of mutually intelligible languages that are spoken by 2,000 to 3,000 people, but they're mostly old. And really, when people say they speak Wangaza, what they're actually speaking is mostly English with Wangaza words in there. Um, so, Changes are definitely happening. Um, a lot of people very, I, I would say pessimistically, but it's, it's the training, 
see that as absolute language death. They see it as shift to English. For me, it's, it's another change, right? I mean, English, right? And I always forget if it's 1044 or 1066, but the French Norman invasion, I mean, we had massive changes. We basically became a Creole of older German and older French, right? And we didn't, don't consider ourselves to speak some sort of derelict language, right? We don't consider ourselves to have completely lost our culture as a result. So, I mean, the idea of language can continue despite massive change and what you see with all sorts of conflict-induced change, or sorry, um, contact-induced change, even with religion, Aboriginal Christianity is quite different from the Christianity we know. Why? Because they incorporate every element of Aboriginal religion that they can to make it continue to make sense to them. Same with language. In fact, Aboriginal English is said to sound very much like English. It, they apply some Aboriginal phonology, so the pronunciation is different. Um, but it's said that even though it sounds like English, that's actually an optical illusion, well, an auditory illusion, I suppose, that the meanings behind their words, every word is defined somewhat differently because it, it continues to have semantic mappings, so meaning scapes that are Aboriginal more than English. So it, it endures, but not in a way that a lot of people recognize. If that, does that over answer your question? <laughs> um, can I go you? Sure. Would recording a language that's not written help to preserve it or just lock it in that period of time? That's something that you get um, claims that you've just sort of frozen yeah. the language. And standardization does that. I mean, in English language, when we think of standard English, which nobody actually speaks, <laughs> right? It's, it's a frozen form of it. So on one hand, yes, absolutely, you end up freezing it, and that's part of the reason why that one person said, but Wong is a written, or sorry, a spoken language, not a written one, or living language, not a written one, because by writing it down, you do, you flatten it, you freeze it. Um, so that's part of the complaint against writing, and I think it's a very valid complaint. It's an argument for um, you know, trying to get more natural modes of transmission going if necessary, or accepting the changes that are happening, accepting that, you know, it's becoming more like English, and that just shows another chapter of your history. Everything about your language shows a chapter of your history. Why is this one so emphatically different? And, I mean, part of the reason is obvious. It was pretty much forced on them, and it was catastrophic personally. But, yeah, it, it absolutely freezes. On the other hand, every language that's ever been written has been frozen. So I'm, I'm not sure what sort of fallout there is from that that we need to be so concerned about. I don't feel like I speak a dead language just because it's written down. So when you talk about reviving a language, you don't really revive the original language. You revive a form. Right. You revive something. I mean, the crucial thing about language is that it's something that people associate with the language, if that makes any sense. So, um, I mean, there are often these ideas that anybody ever spoke it such an idealized, perfect way, and you bring back something that people see as valuable to their culture, valuable as an emblem of who they are, of their identity, and potentially is valuable as sharing their worldview. So the whole semantic mappings thing is, is about an idea, and I'm, I'm not sure I agree with it, but it, it's fairly compelling. Um, that language encodes your worldview. So if you maintain a language that sh keeps your unique worldview or your culture's unique worldview, then you've preserved enough of the culture. And that's going to vary. For some people, just having a few words of their language is enough to say that they've revived their language because it's enough to emblemize their identity. For some, they will never be happy because it will never feel like it's traditional enough. Um, this question is coming from position of profound ignorance, <laughs> but um, I have this kind of uh, impression of Aboriginal visual art mm -hmm. that is sort of an emblematic storytelling yes. system. Is there a direct, uh, some sort of linguistic connection between the spoken language and that? Um, not, not that I know of. There is, if I can go just a off topic, there is a strong link between the development of art itself and the development of language itself. Um, but I, I don't see evidence that there's a strong correlation. All languages are very emblematic. Not all art is quite as emblematic as Aboriginal art is. But watching someone explain to me the specific meaning of the question, right. this is where the water is, and this is. I think the, 
the, the closest correlation you find, it's not the language structure as much as the sorts of stories that are told. Um, if, you, if you try to elicit new verbs by getting a story, because that's a lot of times you get the best language just by telling them to tell you a story. It does not work for Wonga, their Aboriginal languages in general, because every story incorporates two verbs. We were walking, we were sitting. <laughs> and that's sort of the concepts that are in the paintings, too, is that this is where we went, and this is where we stayed, and this is where we went, and this is where we stayed. It's all about water holes. It's all about finding water. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a story a couple of weeks ago on NPR about uh, attempts to um, revive and preserve the Arawak language mm -hmm. from the river reservation, and then was, uh, they created an, an immersion program for preschoolers where they, they lived and talked and did everything in Arawak, and they were learning it very quickly. But as soon as they started kindergarten, um, they started to lose it because. It's no longer school and they're using it all day. Right, the, the immersion program um, has been very successful in some groups. That's no reason to assume it would be successful in all of them. So, um, and actually our camerawoman knows <laughs> a fair bit about the Arapaho um, situation in particular. But in general, that's, that's the solution that worked very well for the Maori. Um, that's part of the reason they're so success successful. Wouldn't work for the Wangava. Why? Maori really see themselves as speaking two languages. There are two main Maori languages. Wangava, three to twelve people per language. Which language do you immerse them in? Right? And that ends up being an immensely political question. Um, so it works best in areas where people can agree on wh what to bloody teach them. <laughs> um, but immersion is really a very, very effective method of language learning in general. So if you're going to figure out, if you find out something to teach, that's a, a good way to do it. It's kind of similar cultural and can I, can I direct that comment to, to the post? Uh, <laughs> anyway, we, we've run out of time uh, for, for uh, Jennifer, but I'd like to thank her very much.